Hi. Um, I'm very happy that you're here. This is the last day of this show, so it's really great that we were able to get together one more push to get seeing these things. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just say that instead of giving a normal, regular gallery tour where we walk around and I say this, I did this painting before this one and this I was looking at a rock, I thought it would be a lot more interesting to do a talk with my dear friend Benito Huerta who is another painter and thinker and curator and educator and we have had um, the chance to talk over the years um, many years. Benito is one of the two people who started Art Lies, and I'm sure many of you know that publication. Um, so we are going to talk a little bit about this, specifically about this work, but I'm more interested in talking about what painting means and what we're thinking it might mean <laughs> as we move forward uh, in this rarefied world. Um, so, first of all, the work in this room, most of it is fairly current. The sculpture, uh, the bronze is the oldest work, and that is work I did many years back with um, Ken King helping me cast uh, these wax figures. All of a sudden I wanted to have things crawling out from the corner of the floor instead of on the wall, which was, you know, a, so usually a two-dimensional format, drawing, painting, prints. So that's how they came about, and I actually was surprised that after doing them, they kind of jumped into the paintings. And you can see in this painting with the black called Eyeing the Door, I think you can actually see some of the forms coming, just, you know, having drawn them. And I remember, uh, you know, suddenly you, you build a vocabulary as you work over the decades, and I think, in a way, these lumpy things, the size of fruit, they look a little bit like the forms I made up and started drawing and painting over the years, but suddenly I could turn them around and see the way a shadow hit. They had volume, they had a different kind of specificity of, of form, and that really helped me. So those of you who are painters, you might want to build the thing that you think you're working on or somehow make it, make a model and look at it in different ways. Um, it's been a, a treat to be in this beautiful building, this space. And one reason is because this is a nonprofit exhibition, I was able to put together things that maybe don't usually get shown and for me, an interesting thing in this show is the interconnectivity of certain um, materials and forms and how something will jump from, say, the monoprints being one, one form, uh, the sculpture, the painting, and how I like for you to get to see the way they all talk to each other and the way they're beginning to uh, inform each other. So later on, we can have questions, or if you have an immediate need for a question, you can jump in. But um, that's pretty much what I want to say to start with about the work in the room. Um, Benito, uh, would you like to begin our, our conversation with sure. anything else? <clears throat> well, first I want to say uh, thank you to Terrell for inviting me to have this conversation. This is actually the second time we've done this. The mm -hmm. first time she had a show in Dallas at um, Gerald Peters, or is it Peters in Pillsbury? I can't remember what. I think what it, was, it was still Pillsbury Peters, I think. Right. Yeah. And so that was a few years ago, and um, I thought the conversation went really well. Um, I was, I'm really glad that she said that we're not doing a traditional kind of going around the gallery and talking about each of the works, because I think it'd be difficult for every one of us to pick up our chairs and move them in front of every piece. <laughs> and, uh, and by, by the end of the hour, we'll probably be really tired. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
but one of the things that uh, when when Terrell asked and I about doing this and and I think Jenny come in and well what do you all want to talk about and I said well how about the death of painting <laughs> and it's like um, because it seems like it seems like every generation that question kind of comes up and if it doesn't come up it's like you know it's like well we don't we don't want to talk about painting <clears throat> but. I think for me, uh, because I am a painter as well, um, and I think that painting has some, been something that I think about, and my wife's also a painter, and so we have this conversation, it's almost on a daily, if not weekly basis, and what is, what, how is the painting relevant to today, in today's art? And for me, it's still relevant, um, and for a lot of reasons. But I think one of the reasons why it's not thought of as being relevant is because uh, nowadays you have art that has kind of broadened scope as far as media is concerned, and as far as its uh, ideas. And you have performance, you have installation, you have video, uh, you have a combination of all those things, you have outdoor works, um, so there's a lot of things going on, which I think is exciting. But we had a, kind of a pre-conversation conversation earlier, and when we kind of mentioned that in the 60s, I think you mentioned in the 60s, when you talked about painting, it was really about painting. And when you talked about You'd say art yeah, it was, meant it, painting. Yeah, so it was just like, this is what this was. It was, a more, in a sense, a more simpler time. But art has grown, just like everything else has grown, it's become more complicated. And there's a lot more <laughs> emphasis on concept-oriented work nowadays, which I think is, is good because I think we, there's a, a, a progression and evolution in, in making of art and its growth as an art form. But I also think, in my opinion, that particularly in the kind of work that Terrell makes, that the intuitive, the emotive side is kind of been relegated to a minor role in making art. I think even if you still come up with concept-oriented work, in the making of the work, you still have to rely on those things, that intuition, particularly in making the work, because it's all, you know, it's in a sense, it all filters through you. I think in Terrell's work, uh, in painting of this manner, is very uh, much more, in a sense, personal. And as we were talking about it earlier, I think is more of a visual poetry that we're seeing as opposed to something that's much more exact in the sense of like Donald Judd's kind of work where he takes his ideas and get them formed out for somebody else to fabricate them and they get done. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying it's another thing. And I think that's where the, the broadening of the scope of what art is has been good. But I also think that sometimes in that regard that our uh, painting and sculpture and uh, drawings sometimes get relegated to a minor role. Saying that, the conversation that my wife has and I have, Janet Chafee, you want to raise your hands so they know who you are? So they know who to blame for this talk? <laughs> so, um, but I say, you know, one of the things that, if you look at, it's what's interesting, if you look at, in, in the case we live in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and you go to the museums and painting is still very relevant, it's still showing in the museums, there's a show at the Modern Art Museum uh, right now of, of, it's a 20 year retrospective of a young artist by the name of Cause, K-A-W-S for those of you who are not familiar. He's a young artist and the majority of the work are paintings. Now, whether you like the work or not, he's still dealing with traditional art forms. He started off as a graffiti artist, even though he's not con in the sense of Keith Haring, where he's creating his own world, he's actually in a sense, kind of uh, co-opting the commercial world and, and made his mark in that and then started kind of growing from there. But, and then there's another uh, artist who's in the Dallas Museum who painted the long hallway. If you're familiar with the Dallas Museum, they had this huge long hallway. And, um, and it's been painted by he and his assistants. And then they have a, a traditional painting in the middle of one of the walls there. And again, I'm thinking it's like, even painting has been able to transform this space and it looks more like an environment space, even though it's still traditional painting. So I think in the end, it comes back to what we were talking about is that in the, in the kinds of arena that Terrell works in, 
It's something that is something that is still to me very relevant because it deals with looking at looking at life through her eyes and it's filtered to her processes, which I think is very uh, an important aspect of how we experience individually uh, the life that we lead. And I think that that's the, the, how I see the work and the, the strokes, the manner of the colors, the manner of the brush strokes, is something that you really cannot describe with words. I think it's a very nonverbal experience. We're talking about poetry, but and then, and then Carol mentioned jazz, and I think it's actually more akin to jazz in the sense that there are no words. It is much more of a, of a state of being, in a sense, and, and that's how um, I see and view her work. And, and also the fact that I don't have a plan before I start. I don't have a preconceived idea of what the piece is going to look like, so it has a kind of improvisational, <coughs> improvisational um, approach, and that's maybe like using my own language I've been developing over the years. So if we want to continue the idea of jazz, let's say there's a song, Stella by Starlight, but every group is going to play it differently. Even that same group on another night will change. So it, it allows spontaneity and freedom within a form that exists, like a song. So I think the, the song for me would be the language of, um, nature, natural objects, lots of things to do with stones and rocks, and you can see that throughout the room, I think. But um, one friend of mine, he was a painter, he's from London, said something interesting about painting to me years ago. He said that um, one friend of his said that <coughs> painting is the most definitive record of the human hand and touch and the way things move and each place, each person, each brush mark will be a recording of a certain moment. The way a good poem does that, you know, a good poem will uh, illustrate something perhaps fairly mundane and beautiful like a, a glass vase on a table with water and light shooting through and suddenly the way it's described um, brings you to an appreciation of the fact that you're alive and have vision or you know these big things that come out of small poems that reflect the knowledge of a lifetime by that poet somehow i think theater does that too a lot of the time it's very nice to have that that sense of um, meaning that is condensed. And I, I hope that you get that in looking at these paintings because there's a lot of thought and layering and years and sometimes things are put away and not resolved and I'll work on a different painting and get the answer to the one that I put away. You know? <laughs> but um, I feel like one, one thing I wanna maybe talk to Benito about is um, a, a good friend of mine who's a painter who isn't working much anymore, but Dara Keaton said, she um, asked me, well, how do you keep from being uh, just labeled as abstract expressionists? And I thought, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, <laughs> maybe that's all right. Maybe it's got some muscle to it. Um, but I did understand the question because it sounds like you're being relegated to a particular time frame that is not so mm. relevant anymore. And I remember when I was working at the Museum for the Archives of American Art, I was sort of the same age as a lot of the core fellows and the program was only a few years old then. And I remember, you know, well, I'm an artist, what do you do, what do you do? And, and, and it was interesting because nobody said, oh, you know, sculpture. They s said, well, I, I pick the material that will best express the idea I have. Sometimes it's paint, sometimes it's furniture upside down with a rip in it, sometimes it's video installation. And so, you know, I'm just a little bit uh, arcane in the sense that I have a 
a studio practice still, and I have a place where I go to work and I think and I'm alone, but I don't think that's very common anymore. Um, and that, Benita, you touched on that a minute ago, but like when you work and look at work and curate, do you see a lot of studios or do you see people researching on computers or what, what do you see? Uh, I, I see a combination. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who are doing you know, studio practice is still important. I think there's also artists who, uh, even if they do even traditional forms, they're doing more research uh, in their work for their ideas, um, then you have people who are just doing all research and then their work culminates in an installation that takes place at that time and doesn't exist after that moment. But going back to your idea of the abstract expressionist label, one of the things that, I, being the age that I'm at, been making art for a number of years now, you kind of see kind of trends come and go, and then you start thinking about artists who've been around for a while. And I remember reading about Anselm Kiefer that um, in the late 60s, early 70s, he kind of turned his back on pop art and, and minimal art and started doing the kind of work he's known for. But at the time he was doing it was totally bucking the system, you know. He had an idea and he stuck with the idea and just kept with it. And I think that for me is, is artists who, uh, who have those kinds of ideas and are committed to that idea. And even though it may not be fashionable, they continue on because that's what they believe in and they believe in their own vision. And I think that for me that being an artist to begin with takes a lot of courage. Then to be an artist and to have an idea and be committed to that idea and even though it may not be fashionable, it takes even a lot more courage. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be as successful as Anselm Kiefer has become, <laughs> but uh, you, I think in the end, what is it really about? And I remember as an, uh, once I decided when I was a student that I was going to be an artist, I realized, well, you know, forget about making a living <laughs> off of being an artist. I realized just right off the bat that it's going to be a hard life, but in the end, what do I get out of it? It's, it's, I get out of it being happy being in the studio. What I think that happens a lot of times is that I think that as a result going to the Kiefer thing, there's an evolution of an artist and there's an evolution of an idea. And going back to the abstract expressionist idea is that's an idea that may have been born out of the 50s or late 40s, which was born out of surrealism uh, that came out of Dadaism, and so there's this kind of trajectory in art. But there's some artists who stick to a certain idea and they just keep going. And an artist who passed away a few years ago here, Dick Ray, is another artist who kind of just had an idea. Maybe he should have been, you know, living in the 50s. I mean, his personality was kind of like that. <laughs> but his artwork was still a progression. It was still an evolution of what was started then. And I think artists who are committed to that and saying, this is what I'm about, and this is the way I see the world, I think it takes a lot of courage. And I think, as a result, you see through their eyes that this art can only be taking place right now. This, the, the work that Terrell makes and other artists who deal with abstraction in their work, <coughs> their work does, cannot exist in the 50s. It would look very different in the 50s uh, than it, you know, it looks now. So I think that again, it, it, you have this evolution of uh, an idea. And basically it's about an idea. It's not just necessarily about style, it's about an idea. Because you talk about ex abstract expressionists and you can talk about Pollock and de Kooning, but and then you have to also talk about Rothko and Barnett Newman, which was, you know, very hard edge, cool kind of abstraction. So, you know, abstraction in itself has, um, you know, a lot of um, paradoxes within itself. So I think that's what happens. And I also talk about, uh, there's an artist that, and, um, I'm also a director at the gallery at the University of Texas in Arlington, and we did a retrospective of an artist that I've known for about 30 years, John Hernandez. And people, you know, would ask him, well, you know, you're Latino, you know, I don't see you being Latino in this work. And I'm thinking it's like, 
Well, you, really, it's not necessarily that it has to look Latino, but if you think about it, if you think about the muralist and their <coughs> compaction of images in a certain parameter of space, he's doing the same thing. The images he uses are contemporary images, but yet he's dealing with a lot of political, social issues. And, and so even though it's not Mexican-American in the way it's looked, it's an evolution of that, just like this is an evolution of the abstract expressionist idea. So what, what is it that one does um, you know, that makes it different? Is again, is the human experience, which is, that goes back to what Cheryl does, is that filtering life through her vision and then applying it through color, through line, uh, texture, and how she manipulates that, and that it is, those things are not easily described in, with words. There's something that you don't really, to me, you describe in words or try to make sense out of them verbally, but you try to understand them from a different perspective, which is the visual emotive perspective. It's like, you know, what is it that you feel from that? And in the end, you know, that's what we all see in art. I mean, the, one of the things that I tell my uh, professional practices class that I teach is that, uh, what, you know, the, what is your first reaction when you're looking at an artwork? Do you like it or do you not like it? And even when you don't like it, you know, why is it that you do not like it? And when, if you do, why? I think that once you start having that conversation, you start kind of realizing, you know, what that, how that art is made up of, but at the same time, the first reaction is all intuitive. It's all kind of yeah, good. Stuff. And, and you can't predict, you know. It's funny too, one of my uh, studio visitors said to me once, a, a curator said, well, be careful and pay attention to the things that you strongly dislike because they'll probably show up in your own work later. Maybe like, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe like, you know, the one thing that drives you crazy about your sister or your mother and it's because you, you're wary of having that trait flare up in yourself. Well, I had this, I had a real, I really had a hard time um, with Clifford Still's work like when I was in my 20s, and I just thought it looked too easy, and I knew exactly how the brush stroke went, and da, da, da. And all of a sudden, everybody who came to see my painting said, ah, <laughs> you're looking at Clifford still. I mean, years later, but you know, and, and, and now I love his work. I just saw an amazing group of his paintings that belong in Denver, but they're in a giant abstract expressionist show at the Royal Academy in London that I got to see. It was a killer, but I mean, for me, this time, in my place in this moment, looking at those paintings meant more to me than most of the other artists who are artists I would normally say are my favorites. So, you know, also I think maybe you, you, you receive, especially if you're a practicing artist, you receive what you need at the time looking at work and, and what, what speaks to you, what calls you. And uh, I think that's pretty interesting. Like, but, but don't you think that sometimes when we are looking at work that we may not like initially, that we um, are in a sense confounded? Because I felt the same way about Clifford Still. Oh, when did first, you? Yeah, I didn't like his work. <laughs> and um, I have Raise your of, hands. I have, I have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or something, Clifford Still <laughs> Anonymous. Um, but. You know, I respect what he did, and I, over time I started, you know, realizing there was more to it, you know, as, as you got older. And then this summer we went to, we were in Denver, mm -hmm. and we went to the Clifford Still Museum, and you saw the evolution of his ideas and how he got to where he was. And all of a sudden, just my respect for the, for the work just got, was, grew immensely. And at that same time at the Denver Museum, right across the street, there was a show about a uh, woman abstract expressionist mm -hmm. from the 40s and 50s that was f some people that you knew, like Lee Krasner and Joan Mitchell, and other artists who you didn't know of. Never Who had of. been slighted, you know, and it was just like a very revealing show. And uh, surprisingly that it's taken this number of years to be put together. But I thought these two shows, I mean, the Clifford Still Museum, to see that work, and to see the evolution of an idea 
and then to see this other show and to see how even today it's still relevant. I mean, those works are still look fresh. And that's why in the end, when the work is really good, there is no time factor. It's timeless. I mean, really good work is in the end timeless. Like music is, though you can tell when something's coming from the Baroque period or something atonal and more contemporary to now, it's still, if it's good, it is timeless. I mm -hmm. think that's a good point. Um, it's part of our experience, it's shared, which is important. And I like what you said about kind of really getting to like Clifford Still when you saw the whole idea and the evolution. Part of that is because you are learning more yourself about what he's gone through, what he's figured out. And then um, I think in a way, that's one thing that's important about showing your work is that it helps people start to learn more. And don't you think almost anything that you're reticent about or, I don't know, a lot of things that at first you're not curious about, you, it helps if, if you're brought in with just a little bit of knowledge and information, you know? And uh, that's one reason I like titling the work, because it does give people a way in to what I'm thinking a little bit. But exposure, and I think, you know, I think the Art League, by the way, is doing a great job of uh, diverse practices. The show before this one was about artists whose principal one of the three shows, but whose principal energy is with education. And they're people who really, they consider their artwork community outreach and working with people and helping. Well, there was one woman I liked a lot from Mexico City who, she lives in Portland, she picked a men's shelter and she's there helping teach those men a lot of them have trades they've always wanted to do, like become a baker. Uh, she's helping them learn how to do that so that they can go out and get the job. So, I mean, that's really interesting. She's, that's what she explains is her art form. So, you know, we have a great example of community sculpture is one phrase I, I think is pretty smart. But, you know, with Project Row Houses here, there are just so many, so many interesting ways for artwork to crawl out and infiltrate the, the world and the community. And, um, but I do think showing your work is brave, and I think it's brave to say you're an artist. And when I was young, I didn't even use that word for like 12 years or something. I didn't think I could say I was an artist. I'd say, well, I draw a little or I paint, but you know, I, I thought of it as, as quite a, an honor but you know, I have a, 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 some young friends, high school, who already say, well, I'm an artist. And they're painting outside with people who are doing murals and street art. And I'm afraid that a lot of what they're looking at is illustrational without a lot of thinking behind it. Or analysis. Well, you don't analyze a lot when you're 17 anyway. But but, but you know, it's interesting because I didn't think of, uh, I, I don't think it's as, as rare or as honored, the idea of saying that you're an artist now. It's almost like, you know, the word artist to a lot of people means someone who makes records. They're not really records either, but <laughs> <laughs> musical artists. But, you know, we were talking a little earlier about how really you know when you're an artist because you just have to do it. And there's really, there's not much reward. The reward has to be the work itself. Because you get, you know, the, the joy of an experience of sharing your work like this show is, but it's not, um, it, it's never enough to go through the effort of working. Do you know what I mean, everybody who's, it's, it, it's like you have, you just have to do it. I mean, and have a day job to support it and, mm -hmm. Uh, know that you're going to be lucky if you cover your supplies <laughs> with that, but um. it was uh, we um, <laughs> Jen and I saw uh, Lars, Lorna Simpson do a talk at the Modern this last Tuesday, and she's primarily known as a photographer. Well, this new show that's opening this weekend at the Modern is a focus show, is uh, paintings. I didn't know that she'd done paintings. She started off as a painter in school and then got into photography. 
And then one of the comments that she made was that painting is a lot of work. I mean, <laughs> physically, it's a lot of work. And it's like, it, and it is, it takes, it, like I mentioned, it takes a real commitment to make uh, the kind of work that you make. I think that one of the things well, I want to just maybe mention real quickly, you mentioned about being an artist. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to say I was an artist when I started out because you felt like you were going to be an outcast. Now, you got to remember, this was <laughs> back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And back in the 70s, there was probably maybe less than a handful of galleries in the Houston area. Uh, mm -hmm. Texas Gallery, Meredith Long, and DuBois Gallery are the ones that I remember from that time period. Uh, at that time, Texas didn't show any Texas artists. <laughs> uh, the both showed only local artists, and then uh, Meredith Long showed national and also a lot of um, faculty from the universities. A lot of the faculty mm -hmm. from the University of Houston, where I went to undergraduate school, were showing there. But I think that at a certain point, you know, I had to claim that I was an artist and say, okay, this is what I'm at. I might as well just say that. And, you know, if people don't, you know, Look, uh, start looking at you strangely when you say you're an artist, well, so be it. <laughs> um, but, you know, in the end, you have to uh, take a stand. But one of the things, I do, I do want to get kind of back to the work a little bit. One mm -hmm. of the things that you mentioned that is kind of evident in the bronze works, you were talking about making clay works earlier mm -hmm. in, in our pre-conversation conversation. conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, one of the things that you mentioned in the clay works is that you had this... Um, this is a Japanese uh, clay master who came and saw the work and said, your work is very unusual. You're not trying to impose your will on the work. You're allowing the clay to be clay. And I think that's also true in the paintings and, and the works that you're doing in the show, is that you're also allowing the medium to be its own thing mm -hmm. as well. You're not trying to c impose your will on it and make it do something else. You're, you're allowing it to be paint on the surface. Well, thank you. I, I love the material of paint. That's one reason I've got to always be fooling around with the, the, the actual pigment and color and light that it can bring forward. But maybe it's a little bit like when my friends who write fiction talk about uh, the character sort of telling them what it wants to be, what he wants to be, what, he, what would she do, or, or playwrights who get involved with the lives of their characters. I think paintings, if you're quiet and alone and can listen, tell you where they're going. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they're very difficult telling you where you're going. But this painting, which looks so uh, luminous, almost worked about six times. And then I had to run in and wreck it. And, and then, more and more, and finally I did these big dark structures. I was kind of thinking about the skin of uh, plums and the inside of figs and nature, but I painted these big dark kind of masses and clouds and, you know, that was just looked really heavy and, you know, went away, had a meeting with somebody, came back and put it on the floor and got out some linseed oil and big brushes and, you know, boom. I did, finished it in 30 minutes, but it, it's, uh, it, it was a, a naughty teenager. It was a, a killer. That was, that was a tough one, that one. And, and to me, it looks maybe like the most self-made or instantaneous or, anyway, doesn't look like struggle. Some of the others do. So, um, interesting. Do you all have questions?